Change of Narrative Theory The Change of Narrative Theory is a theory that posits that the narrative of the Bible has been changed over time. The claim is... What is the claim? <clears throat> yes, the theory is that the original message of the Bible has been changed. To start, they point to the Nestle Allen edition. Nestle Allen edition is a critical edition of the New Testament in its original Koine Greek. It's the basis of most modern Bible translations. It is currently in its 28th edition. They raise the claim that the fact that it is in its 28th edition indicates changes. What is a critical edition? Critical edition or critical text is a compilation of text that has been selected, organized, and presented by scholars intended to best approximate to the original. At the same time, the critical text should document variant readings so that da 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 reconstructed original is apparent to a reader of the critical edition. The Greek text, as presented, is what biblical scholars refer to as the critical text. The critical text is an eclectic text compiled by a committee, da 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 da, large number of manuscripts in order to determine which reading is most likely to be closest to the original. They use a number of factors to help determine probable readings, yada yada yada, to figure out basically the likelihood of accidental or intentional corruptions. In the book, a large number of textual variants or differences between manuscripts are noted in the critical apparatus. This just presents some evidence for the text of the Bible being altered, as do books like the text of the New Testament, its transmission, corruption, and restoration. But this is known to people familiar with the Bible. This doesn't necessarily establish the change of narrative theory. True, they also highlight the reality that Bible scholars won't say that what we have now is the original, unchanged version of the scripture. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, can we please direct your attention to the preface of the Revised Standard Version. Yet the King James Version has grave defects. By the middle of the 19th century, the development of biblical studies and the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision of the English translation. Of the English translation. Thirty-two scholars have served da 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 review and counsel of advisory board of fifty representatives of cooperating denominations. So all these people came together to make a revision. Sometimes it is evident that the text has suffered in transmission, but none of the versions provides a satisfactory restoration. Here we can only follow the best judgment of competent scholars as to the most probable reconstruction of the original text. Such corrections are indicated in the footnotes by the abbreviation CN and a translation of the Masoretic text is added. And the preface of the Bible in Living English. The author Stephen states Since 
Sometimes even intentional changes were made. Jeremiah 8.8 8 says that in Jeremiah's time, the commonly accepted copies of the Law of Moses were so incorrect as to contain substantial falsehoods. Jeremiah's words seem to mean that the false matter had been willfully put in. And it would be hard to prove that our copies of the Law are not made from the ones that were commonly accepted in Jeremiah's time thus establishing that there have been alterations to the Bible and scholars acknowledge the fact. It's in the preface. And they quote Bible commentaries like William Barclay's Daily Study Bible. Daily Study Bible. What then are we to say of our present passage? Revelation 14.4 If we are to treat it honestly, we cannot avoid the conclusion that it praises celibacy and virginity and belittles marriage. There are two possible explanations. A. It is possible that the writer of the Revelation did mean to exalt celibacy and virginity. The likelihood is that he was writing about A.D. 90, when this tendency was already in the church. Marriage? No. <laughs> if that is so, we will have to lay this passage on one side. Because, tested by the rest of the New Testament, it is not a correct statement of the Christian ethic. B. There is another possible interpretation. Yada yada yada. This is all the more likely since many of the later scribes were monks. When the manuscript was recopied, the comment in the margin may well have been included in the text, as very commonly happened. This would mean that the first half of Revelation 14.4 is not the words of John at all, but the comment of a scribe. Explanations of how opinions of people crept into the text. Explanations of how opinions of people crept into the text. Okay, I see where you're going with this, but not quite a strong case for the change of narrative theory yet. And here we go. So, if you look at the four Gospels, according to Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, if you want to read the Gospels as eyewitness accounts, historical records, and so on, then not only are we in for some tough going, I think there's evidence within the material itself that it's not intended to be read that way. They don't claim to be eyewitness accounts of his life. They're not biographies. I mean, there are all sorts of details about Jesus that they're simply not interested in giving us. What they do is proclaim their individual author's interpretation, interpretation of the Christian message through the device of using Jesus of Nazareth as a spokesperson for the evangelist's position. Who is Paula Fredrickson? A historian and author of Augustine on Romans, From Jesus to Christ, The Origins of the New Testament Images of Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, On the Passion of the Christ, Augustine and the Jews, Paul the Pagan's Apostle, When Christians Were Jews, Augustine and the Jews, Paul the Pagan's Apostle, When the Christians Were Jews, not an eyewitness account, not a biography, rather what they are are attempts to record the life and teachings of Jesus. Mark is generally agreed to be the first gospel. The gospel tradition divides into two streams. There's Mark 
and there's John. Mark is the earliest gospel, written probably shortly after da 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 da, and Mark presents one tap of Jesus with a particular narrative da 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 da. John, a gospel that we can't date at all, has Jesus da 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 da. It's a quite different story with a quite different personality. Matthew and Luke depend on Mark, which is why those three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptic gospels because they could be understood together. But in terms of literary dependency, Matthew and Luke construct their story around the plot provided by Mark. Mark is the earliest, probably written, between 70 and 75. Matthew is next, written somewhere between 75 and 85, maybe even a little later than that. Luke is a little later, later still, being written between 80 and maybe 90 or 95. And John's Gospel is the latest, usually dated around 95, although it may have been completed slightly later than that as well. Author of two award-winning books, From Jesus to Christianity, Scripting Jesus. So, the order is Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Got it. And now presenting the snowball effect. The change of narrative takes place. It is only in the last and most evolved gospel you find. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. I, I am and the, Father, the Father. He who, who has seen, seen me. me. Before Abraham was. If the I Ams had been part of the original tradition, it is very hard indeed to explain why none of the other three evangelists made use of them. Why none of the other three evangelists made use of them. The Evidence for Jesus, James Dunn The issuer and the defender of the claim emphasize the fact that it's only the fourth gospel that contains the most evolved narrative and not the first three. A deviation from the original? Let us examine the facts and you will witness the evolution. Mark 6.52 versus Matthew 14.33 Here is the account in the gospel according to Mark. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. Compare with the account of the same incident in Matthew. And when they climbed into the boat, the, the wind, wind died, died down. down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. Their hearts were hardened to worshipping. Mark, Matthew, Luke, verses John, 10.18 Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you, you will. will. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He walked away, about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will be done, not, not mine. mine. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. My own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The praying is gone. Supplication disappeared. No requests in John, and not your will, but my will. John Dominic Crossan, when asked about the evolution of the four Gospels, states, You have a Jesus out of control almost in Mark, a Jesus totally in control 
in John. Mark 3.35 versus Matthew 12.50 For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. For whoever, For whoever does, does the, the will, will of my God, my Father in heaven is my, is brother, my brother and sister, and, sister and, and mother. Will of God to will of my Father. By the way, the Gospel of Mark calls God Father four times, times in the early Gospel in comparison to 118, 118 times in the last Gospel. Johnny boy, I tell you. Mark 9, 5 verses Matthew 17, 4. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Mark 13.35 verses Matthew 24.42 Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Mark 4.38 verses Matthew 8.25 And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And they went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Lord, Save us, we're perishing. Mark 8, 29, verses Matthew 16, 15, and 16. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, You're the Messiah. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah. The Son of the Living God. Teacher to Lord, Master to Lord, Rabbi to Lord, Messiah to the Son of God. Not only are things being added to the narrative, but things are being removed from them as well. Mark 10, 17 and 18 versus Matthew 19, 16 and 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. God alone. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want eternal life, keep the commandments. Commenting on this, James Dunn writes in his book, The man addresses Jesus as good teacher, and Jesus replies with a mild rebuke, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Luke sees no difficulty with these words and reproduces them more or less exactly. Not so with Matthew, as we see in the synopsis. The difficulty for Matthew, presumably, lay in the fact that Jesus was being shown by Mark to disclaim any right to the description good. And by his own logic, Jesus was thereby disclaiming any right to be regarded as divine. If only God is good, and Jesus rebukes that address good teacher, the most obvious corollary is that Jesus is not God. Once again, Matthew solves the problem by modifying Mark's wording. By modifying Mark's wording. And once again, the surgery is very neat and delicate. For in this case too, he stays as close as he can to Mark's wording and reduces the alteration to a minimum. First, he alters the wording of the man's initial question by moving the word good from the address and by putting it as the object of the sentence. That is enough to resolve the potential problem posed by Mark. But, of course, that initial alteration means that Jesus' reply in Mark's version makes less sense. So a second modification is required. Here too, Matthew stays as close as he can to Mark's wording. 
The first sentence of Jesus' reply causes little difficulty, even if Matthew's version seems rather stilted. Mark, why do you call me good? Matthew, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus' second sentence, according to Mark, would appear to be less relevant to Matthew's version, since it was responding directly to the Markan address, good teacher. Matthew, indeed, might well have omitted it altogether, since it made less sense in his revised version. But evidently, in this case too, he wanted to stay as close as possible to the traditional wording of the opening dialogue. So he keeps his modification to a minimum and retains the words of Jesus despite their irrelevance and lack of coherency in his form of the story. Mark, no one is good but God alone. Matthew, one there is who is good. When all these factors are taken into consideration, the case for seeing here a revision of Mark's account by Matthew seems to be overwhelming. Whereas it must be judged far less likely that Mark's version was formed as a modification of Matthew. The awkwardness of Matthew's version is stylistic and most obviously to be explained as an attempt to deal with the theological awkwardness of Mark's version. Of Mark's version. Of Mark's version. Um, that's pretty clear. Dunn is saying that Matthew purposely and strategically changed the narrative. Changed the narrative. Changed the narrative. Stay with me. Two more examples. It's all I ask. Mark 11, 12 through 14 and 11, 20 and 21 versus Matthew 18 through 20. Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him saying it. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Here is the version in Matthew. He was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. No mention of the fact that it was because it was not the season. The withering was immediate. The withering was immediate. Revision of the First Commandment And one of the teachers of the law came and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked them, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, This is the most important. This is the most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Matthew's account. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law? Which is the most important commandment in the law? Jesus answered, Love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This is the first and greatest commandment. Removing things, not the season. Good teacher, even the first commandment. Here's a quote from the book, Jesus in the Gospels and Acts. Despite this, scholars recognize that their differences of detail are irreconcilable, and any attempt to harmonize them would only disrupt their distinct theological messages. Theological messages. I say to you, what then was the original narrative? The original narrative. Before the layers of tradition, culture, individual interpretations, and personal viewpoints were heaped onto it. And this, ladies and gentlemen, concludes a look at the change of narrative theory.